Hello brothers and sisters, this cup, Jesus entered into the garden. He is going to pray to his father. As Jesus prayed, he was given a cup to drink from. In this cup, Jesus sees our iniquities, our sin. How deep is the darkness of sin? I would like to start by saying, I just want to go home, but must finish the race. In this, I pray that you see the deeper meaning of what is being said. I am just a man trying to express that which has been revealed to me. Also, I am seeing how this writing in particular is tying in with everything else that I have written through the Holy Spirit. I would never willingly mislead anyone. I am not smart, and that's a good thing. I am not all-knowing. This is also a good thing. I only want of what our Father in Heaven gives, nothing of myself. I am merely speaking the words put upon my heart in the best way that I can. Many people come against those who are speaking what God has put in their hearts to speak. For this is the latter rain, the raining down of the Holy Spirit. And there will come many scoffers, mocking, pointing fingers, whisperers, haters of righteousness, haters of the one living inside you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He lives within you. He covers you in his mantle, like when Elijah left his mantle for Elisha. Also, when Jesus was raised up by his own power, he left his shroud, the cloth that he was buried in. This is a foreshadow showing us how we would be covered, covered in righteousness. The wicked cannot stand it, bringing every form of torments. Their evil deeds will be for nothing but stubble blowing in the wind. Yet, how they will try pulling you down. Nonetheless, God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. This is the latter rain. What happened in the Garden of Eden? This that is presented is only one aspect, as we cannot fully understand the fullness of what actually happened in the garden. We can only have faith, open our ears, our hearts, listen, and piece together that which we can through study, praying, and of the revelation through the Holy Spirit. For we must understand that Adam and Eve knew nothing of good and evil. They were told not to partake or even touch it, for they were made from truth, which is our Father. And they walked and talked with God. Now, God said to Adam, You can eat of any tree of the garden, but not this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall ye touch it. For in the day that you do, you shall surely die. Not you might die, not it's possible that you could die, but you shall surely die. When you eat of this tree, you will be blinded to the truth. They then saw that they were naked, and they were ashamed. Ashamed? Why? Because they lost something. They knew that they had rebelled against God, and they hid themselves and tried covering their nakedness. When you eat of this tree, you will then take it upon yourselves the responsibility to distinguish between good and evil. You will truly know, see, and dwell where the darkness and the light clash. For you see, the earth rests between the light and the darkness. There is friction, a conflict, a battle. You will be vulnerable and even participate in wickedness. 
you will also be manipulated into thinking that your works will grant you entrance into the kingdom of Yahweh. However, it is only through Yeshua, Savior Messiah, and His work through the cross. In partaking of this tree, of the no in partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. All are appointed once to die, and all my children they did cry, but through my son the work is done. If you eat or partake of this tree, you will then define and dictate for your own personal selves what makes up your construct of good and evil, bringing out the imaginations of the heart. Imaginations are not truth. Imagination is what we see running rampant in this world. Everyone doing the imaginations of his own heart. Disregarding the truth as they see through, as they see their own truth, which is not the truth, but fables and rebellion against the truth of God. You will claim that, is your, that it is your right to dictate for yourself and others the difference between good and evil. It is something that has separated us from God. It is rebellion against God, for he said, do not eat of this tree. If you eat from this tree, you will live in a place filled with sickness, heartache, pain, suffering, absolute darkness. There is a massive difference between truth and good and evil. If you do something good, it doesn't mean that it's truth. Likewise, in doing evil, it doesn't mean truth. Doing something good is just good in your eyes, likewise with evil. Although truth can be found in these things, nonetheless, truth is truth. I pray that you see what is being said here. God sent them out of the garden, lest they partake of the tree of life and live forever in sin. Okay, brothers and sisters, I'll be doing the next one very soon. God bless each and every one of you. Hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is This Cup, Part 2. Jesus is the only light shining in this world. And you, being born again, he lives in you. And now you are a light shining. You are a vessel housing the light of God, projecting it out into a darkened world, like unto a mirror. You are now reflecting his love as seeing the world through his eyes. The Holy Spirit is the oil keeping the fire burning as you hunger after the word of God. We can look back throughout time and see what sin has done. We can see what sin has done in our own lives if we are not proud and arrogant. For in this world, men love darkness rather than light. For you see, it was the wicked one who opened or rather blinded our eyes that we would see through his eyes, by our own free will. Seeing through his eyes is to be blinded from the truth. God came into this world, wrapping himself in the flesh, that he would open the eyes of the blind, that we shall see clearly the truth. We must understand that we all have free will to choose what we do. Our will is also conflicting with and against the will of others also. It is about choosing the will of God through his only begotten Son. In doing this, you are made holy and righteous in the sight of our Father. As he washes you clean in his own blood, now becoming his hands down here. Jesus fulfilled all things as it is written, 
Jesus cried out, It is finished. It is accomplished. Jesus seals you in his righteousness. What is the will of God? That none shall perish, but that all come to repentance. Confess that Jesus is Lord, and through him eternal life. Jesus is the will of God. Today, we are running parallel with the days of Noah before the flood, when the 200 watcher angels fell in the time of Jared, leaving their former estate and interweaved with the daughters of men who begat children to them, those who became the giants, the mighty men. Mighty in this terminology means hunters of men, just like Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was a hunter of men, not a mighty hunter of rabbits and deer, but of men. The fallen ones and their offspring proceeded to unleash abomination in the sight of God, corrupting all flesh. These fallen ones are separate or different from the fall of the wicked one and the third of the angels, but this is for another time. Only Noah and his family were allowed in the ark to escape the flood. This is also a foreshadow of the second coming of Christ. Also, we are running parallel with the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot and his small family were the only to escape judgment as fire and brimstone came raining down, a time where the lust of the flesh overtook and consumed the minds and hearts of men, an abomination unto the Lord, committing uncleanness, a moral decay, and spiritual death. The men of all ages in this city surrounded the house of Lot, demanding that the angels come out, that they may know them. To know them doesn't mean shaking hands and how are you, no, but to lay down with them an abomination. They did this with all those who came to these cities, whether they were willing or unwilling, and after were beaten, robbed, and every other wicked thing. Now in this world, this sin that God calls an abomination is pushed into acceptance, even glorified. This abomination is now being taught to our children as normal, even elevating it to a high platform and standard that claims individuality, pride, and perfection, something to be strived for. You are now labeled evil and hateful if you do not conform or accept this abomination, and it's going to get much worse as the labor pains increase. The act of committing just one sin can lead an individual down a road to total destruction of one's self. And the individual also has potential to devastate many other lives as they begin to spiral out of control, as sin will envelope and blind you as it weaves every thread of wickedness together, wrapping you in bondage. This sin will ultimately devoid one's self of a conscience, as God will give you over to a reprobate mind. There are those who commit sin and are sorrowful and seek repentance, and there are those who commit sin and embrace it, calling it their own. These who are in rebellion, these who despise the truth, these who turn their backs from the Lord, these who turn from the light, chasing after their own shadows, running blindly into the darkness. This is but a fraction of the darkness that Jesus saw as he looked into the depths of this cup. My brothers and sisters, uh, I'm, I gotta make a part three. And I'm an, I'll get back to each and every one of your comments. I love reading your comments. I love seeing what you have to say. And 
God bless each and every one of you. I'll talk to you very soon. Hello brothers and sisters. This is part three of this cup. Any one of us who would have looked into, the, into that cup would not have been able to comprehend what we would see. Dropping it as complete, absolute horror would have engulfed you with just one glimpse into that cup. But Jesus, with his forever loving eyes, penetrated deeply into the depths of this cup. Deep into the depths of this darkness. With complete, absolute, compassionate, forever burning, everlasting love. He embraced this cup and said to his father, Mark 14, 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nonetheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. If there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thine. And he drank the fullness of the cup. Yeshua, Savior Messiah, took all the sin of all the world, past, present, future, into himself, carrying it to the cross. He was looking past all of this ugliness, all the filthiness, all the wretchedness, all the things that most of us could not even comprehend, even to the deepest of our darkest thoughts. Jesus sees our sin. He sees our struggle. He looked deep inside this cup, down to the individual, the suffering, the heartbreak, the tragedy, how sin truly separates us from God, a rebellion against God, the brokenness, shards of shattered lives scattered, strung out across the generations, from Adam to the, to the end, which is really our beginning. Hallelujah, praise be to God. He sent his only son. Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, sees all of our tears down to each individual tear breaking loose from our eyes. And he catches away each one of those tears to a special place. As Jesus then drank the fullness of this cup, he actually sweat huge drops of clotted blood as it was fully revealed to him the fullness of what he would go through. He saw how his own father would turn away from him as all sin would be laid upon his own head. How he would for the first time be separated from his own father it crushed him, and he embraced it. He took inside himself our sin and carried it to the cross. Through his overflowing abundance of grace, mercy, and love, you are justified, justified through his obedience unto the cross, making you a reborn son, making you a reborn daughter of the Most High God. Yeshua, Savior Messiah, took your and my sin upon himself to the cross. The one who committed no sin bore our iniquities upon himself, even unto the horrible, agonizing death of the cross. The suffering was horrific, unimaginable, incomprehensible, agonizing, profoundly unmatched to anything we could comprehend. Jesus God in the flesh did this to keep us out of hell. His blood was shed to sanctify us, taking away our iniquities, making you righteous in the sight of a holy God. With every lash, with every mocking tongue, every punch, slap, kick, being spat upon, the ripping out of his beard, the cap of thorns upon his head, the piercing of the spikes driven through his hands and feet. It is finished, he cried. 
Luke 23:46 And when Jesus had cried out and and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said Father into thy hands I commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up the ghost All of this he has done on a personal level just for you to show that he loves you and willingly drank the fullness of this cup for you personally. Behold the suffering servant. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the hand that drives the nail. Behold the hand that never failed. Behold, I tell you, that he is risen. Behold the name above all names. Behold, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Behold, the Son of the living God. Behold, the blood, the precious blood of Christ. Behold, thy kingdom come. He sits on his throne in all everlasting glory. He loves you with an everlasting love. Genesis 3.15 and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, to point out something very important. God formed man and put him in the garden. And now, after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 3.23, Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. The Lord God took him from the garden and put him back where he was taken from, the earth, this place which rests between the light and the darkness. In Genesis 4.17, we see two different bloodlines coming into focus, that of the children of Cain the children of disobedience. In, chapter, in Genesis chapter 5, we see the children of Seth, the children of the promise, the bloodline leading to the birth of our beloved Lord and Savior. David fulfilled the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 in the physical by killing Goliath, in which he carried a staff and the stone, representing the cross and the cornerstone, the rock. David took the giant's head back to Jerusalem, burying it in the hill of the skull. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy in every way as he was crucified on this hill, his foot crushing the head of the serpent as he trampled underfoot sin and death, fulfilling and putting an end to the ancient prophecy that God proclaimed from the beginning. There is so much more that we couldn't, couldn't ever, that we could never comprehend in this cup. Praise be to his name forever and ever. God bless each one of you, my brothers and sisters. See you next time.